just enough, yeah. Which is like, it's double, it's twofold because like it is kind of like yeah. Yeah. rather than better, but like there's just no like, people asking to get better. Yeah, yeah. Like, 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 you don't have a history of drug yeah. abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Oh, I'm so sorry. No, you're good. I'm glad that you're doing better, though. I was wondering where you were. Well, these guys are high end. The high end Yeah. Good, how are you?
Okay, I believe we're ready to roll here. Um, Subcommittee of National Security Illicit Finance International Financial Institutions will come together, will come to order. The objection chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is titled Mission Critical, Restoring National Security as the Focus of National Defense Production Act Reauthorization. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. <clears throat> In response to the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950, my fellow Missourian, President Harry Truman, signed a law intended to ensure that our nation would have sufficient industrial resources to meet our national security needs. Among the key authorities that the Defense Production Act, or DPA, gave the President was the authority to prioritize the production and delivery of items critical to our national security. It also provided a series of financial tools to incentivize the creation or growth of our domestic capacity to manufacture those items particularly those that otherwise not, might not be made in the United States. And it now forms a basis for the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, CFIUS, to ensure that foreign adversaries aren't able to use the fruits of our free market innovation against the United States. For almost three quarters of a century, the DPA smoothly and quietly functioned with annual appropriations for industrial incentives, generally in the range of $50 million, modest by DOD standards today. This committee checked in on DPA from time to time in recent years, mostly focused on CFIUS. The last time this committee held a general hearing on DPA was more than a decade ago in May of 2013. However, I decided to call today's hearing because over the past few years, the federal government has rapidly increased its use of DPA's financial tools to address a variety of challenges. For example, in March 2020, Congress appropriated $1 billion the DPA account through the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act, to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. Then in 2022, Congress appropriated another roughly $1.25 billion to DPA, $750 million of which uh, in the Ukraine Supplemental for Weapons Production, and another $500 million in the Inflation Reduction Act, half for domestic mining and mineral processing, and half for clean energy programs. Over the last six plus years, the White House also referenced DPA in a series of executive orders and other actions, beginning with former President Trump's prescient 2017 order for the Defense Department to analyze our defense and manufacturing industrial base and assess supply chains for the resilience to, to potential shocks. DOD's recommendation in the subsequent report to rely on DPA Title III arguably kicked off a DPA revival. A few short years later, in 2020, COVID delivered a dramatic shock to our supply chains, and then President Trump, in addition to deploying funds through Title III, invoked DPA Title I so the Department of Health and Human Services could prioritize contracts for health and medical resources such as personal protective equipment. HHS also used DPA to prioritize the production of ventilators, which, was badly, which were badly needed and in short supply at that time. While well, taking office, President Biden also embraced DPA, beginning with one of his earliest executive orders to strengthen U.S. supply chain resilience. In May of 2022, President Biden invoked the DPA to require suppliers to provide key inputs to infant formula manufacturers before any other uh, customers. A month later, he again leaned on DPA, this time to accelerate domestic production of energy technologies, including solar panel parts, insulation, heat pumps, biofuels, and power grid infrastructure. Finally, last fall, the Biden administration deployed DPA twice more. First, to foster investment in domestic manufacturing of essential medicines, and second, and more controversial, to compel private companies to provide information to the government about their work on AI. The level of support for these various applications of DPA has varied across party lines, and we welcome that debate. But I hope we can all agree as a starting point that the United States must have a strong defense industrial base, if only to ensure success in our global competition with China. This is a fundamental rationale for the DPA today. The DPA has generally been reauthorized in five-year increments, and the current reauthorization expires at the end of fiscal year in September 2025, about 18 months from now. In previous renewals, Congress stripped out provisions that were no longer relevant and added new provisions to address contemporary challenges. In my view, our current situation requires a DPA that, as job one, deploys its limited resources to ensure that the United States has the industrial capacity to defend our nation against the generational challenge posed by China. Today, our panel of witnesses will help the committee identify appropriate solutions that Congress could implement in the next reauthorization 
by discussing the history and mechanics of the DPA, how it has been employed, and how it can be focused, modernized, and improved. With that, the Chair now recognizes the ranking member of Subcommittee on National Security, Illicit Finance, and International Financial Institutions, the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Beatty, for four minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to our witnesses, and thank you for holding this hearing. The Defense Production Act is what we're here to discuss today, as you've heard from our chairman. This is our first dedicated DPA hearing in over a decade. The DPA, which many may be surprised to know, is under the jurisdiction of the House Financial Services Committee, this committee, and gives the president the authority to take various actions to ensure the supply of materials and services necessary for national defense. The powers granted to the executive branch under the DPA are not to be taken lightly. They enable the president to prioritize government contracts, waive international trade requirements, and offer incentives within the domestic market to enhance the production of critical materials and technologies, if deemed necessary for national defense. Since the law's inception during the Korean War, Congress has amended the definition of national defense to include emergency preparedness, critical infrastructure protection and restoration, homeland security, and certainly much more. Given these broad powers, we must take a prudent approach to DPA application as we consider widening the lens through which we look at national security in a rapidly evolving world. To be clear, national defense looks different today than it did 70 years ago. Today it means being energy independent and client resilient, fortifying our supply chains, supporting our allies abroad, and bolstering United States competition. In recent years, the executive branch has appropriately used the DPA to address crises outside of the traditional fear of national defense. During the horrific COVID-19 pandemic, invocation of the DPA quite literally saved lives, facilitating the production of ventilators, respirators, vaccinations, and coronavirus tests to help Americans weather the storm. With the increase of frequently a frequency of extreme weather events that cost us billions of dollars in damage and results in thousands of access of deaths per year, there is no doubt that climate change is a national security risk. Accordingly, President Biden justifiably issued presidential determinations, and certainly we've heard the list of things that President Biden uh, used it for stated by our chairman. Accordingly, President Biden also used presidential determinations to accelerate domestic manufacturing of clean energy technology. As we look ahead to what the next crisis might be, whether it's climate change, a pandemic, or war, we must continue to use DPA wisely and reinforce our readiness to tackle major challenges. During the Korean War, American industry turned on a dime to ensure that we win the war effort, and we did it again in the 21st century to combat the horrific virus that took out more than 1.1 million American lives. United States competitors are looking ahead at the challenges of the future. We must do the same, leveraging tools like the DBA to boast to boost U.S. strength and stability. As we prepare to reauthorize this essential legislation in the coming year, I look forward to working with my Republican colleagues to once again on this historic on this historical bipartisan effort. And again, I like to thank our witnesses for being here, and I look forward to your testimony. And I yield back. Very good. Thank you for that, um, Ms. Beatty. Today we welcome the testimony of uh, our. Four witnesses, and we start with Mr. Uh, Luke Nicastro, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Nadonner, and uh, Mr. Roger Sakaim, and Dr. Todd Tucker. Uh, we thank each of you for taking time to be here. Uh, you'll each be recognized for five minutes to give your oral parts, portion, presentation of testimony. Without objection, each of your written statements may be part of the record. Um, this is a little housekeeping note. The gentleman on the end is transcribing all that takes place today, and so sometimes the microphones need to be pulled very close to you 
they're pretty good. They've improved them some giving since I've been here in the, over the years. But those boxes in front of you do move forward if you just pull them toward yourself uh, so you get as close to it, straighten out the microphone to make sure you can almost take a bite out of it. The gentleman can, can hear what's being said and be able to transcribe that. Okay? Other than that, you guys have five minutes. Um, you know, whenever you see the little uh, yellow button on, go on on your, uh, your screen there or in your box, uh, that means you've got a minute to wrap up. Uh, when it hits red, um, I have the gavel. So um, with that, uh, Mr. Um, LaDonna, you're apparently recognized for five minutes for your remarks. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lukemeyer, Ranking Member Beatty, uh, members of this committee. I testify before you today in firm support of the reauthorization of the Defense Production Act, however contingent on certain revisions and reforms. The DPA, as you know, confers upon the President authorities to shape the domestic industrial base so that when called upon, it can provide essential materials and goods needed for the national defense. Through more than 50 authorizations, Congress has expanded that definition to include domestic preparedness and response to natural hazards, terrorist attacks, and even to encompass renewable energy sources such as solar, geothermal, wind, and biomass. This promiscuous growth in the definition of national defense is a concern I share. Nonetheless, as I saw firsthand as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, the DPA, if properly employed, remains an important tool to fill gaps in supply chains. And those gaps, they can stop the production of crucial military systems, they can fix weaknesses in defense infrastructure, and they can mobilize the country in the face of a broader national crisis, as was the case with COVID-19. Now, the broader global risk context is essential. The correlation of military and economic forces is deteriorating for the United States of America around the world. Look at the return of industrial scale land warfare in Europe. Look at Iran's proxy offenses across the Middle East. And most of all, look at an aggressive China, which has a defense and manufacturing industrial base that dwarfs our own. Indeed, the emerging China threat is on par with the Axis during World War II and the Soviet Union thereafter. And America confronts these challenges with a, with a defense industrial base that is much withered and denuded since the Cold War. So with this fragile industrial infrastructure, it is all the more necessary to have special rapid authorities at the ready when an acute need arrives for scarce parts and materials. The most compelling and pure use of this authority in recent memory came in the summer of 2007 when Secretary of Defense Robert Gates invoked the DPA to secure supplies for reinforced steel to build MRAPs uh, to blunt the IEDs that were killing our troops daily in Iraq. Now today we are focused on DPA Title III awards. These awards can support military supply chains, national defense mobilization, and critical civil infrastructure. Now these categories could encompass shipyards, materials, mineral refinery, large water pumps, electrical generators, wiring, agricultural equipment, as well as transportation and computing infrastructure. Now, having worked at senior executive levels of the Defense Department and industry, I hold that the DPA should be reauthorized to focus more effectively on national defense and indispensable public systems that enjoy uncontroversial, widespread, bipartisan support. A reformed authority would make the DPA a ready tool to first rescue and fix the very serious gaps in America's defense industrial base and buttress the related commercial supply chains, and second, enable a defense mobilization provided that the Congress and a future president determine one is necessary. The U.S. defense industrial base cannot be relied on to meet the nation's needs today. DPA Title III could provide a crucial part in reviving that base. And we're going to need significantly more output if the international situation continues to deteriorate in defense supplies like ships, autonomous vehicles, aircraft, and most of all, longer range munitions. The skillful and systematic use of DPA could fill these holes, and I wish to stress, enable the entry of new defense tech companies who, as we've seen with space launches and drones, enabled by artificial intelligence, can do things more quickly and cheaply and with more competition given the proper opportunity and incentives. 
The country should have the option, as Congress and FDR created before World War II, to tap commercial entrepreneurs to bring innovation, competition, and economies of scale to military production. And here the key word is before. So as you'll note in my prepared statement, I propose seven reforms to the DPA, including uh, use of more expanded use of, um, of loans and how that can happen, and also the kind of expertise and the executive agent relationships that the DPA office will need. I would also note that uh, DPA Title III could benefit from FAST 41 uh, authorities for permitting, it is no good to get a DPA grant if one does not get the permitting and cannot train the workforce to make that happen. So with that, I hope that the Congress will uh, reauthorize the DPA and do it now so it's at the ready should the nation need it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donner. I forgot to introduce each one of you with regards to your backgrounds. And Mr. Donner is a former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Policy and Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at Govini. And uh, Mr. Nicastro is next up. And Mr. Nicastro is an analyst in U.S. Defense Policy at Congressional Research Service. Sir, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Wickemeyer, Ranking Member Beatty, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting the Congressional Research Service to testify today. This morning, I'll summarize my written statement on the Defense Production Act of 1950, or DPA, starting with a brief overview of the statute itself followed by a sketch of its historical development and recent uses. I'll conclude by offering a few issues facing Congress. The DPA provides the President with an array of authorities to, quote, shape national defense preparedness programs and maintain and enhance the domestic industrial base. Over the past 74 years, successive administrations have used the DPA as a tool to manage the nation's defense-related productive capacity, invoking its authorities to increase the domestic supply of goods and materials. These authorities are grouped into titles, of which three are extant today. Title I, which allows the President to require industry to accept and prioritize contracts and orders to promote the national defense. Title III, which allows the President to provide loan guarantees, loans, purchase commitments, grants, and other financial assistance to businesses to expand productive capacity and supply. And Title VII, which provides the President with a variety of authorities including the powers to obtain information from businesses, form agreements with industry, and block certain corporate transactions. Title VII also defines key terms, notably national defense, and provides for the act's termination. The DPA was originally enacted in 1950 at the beginning of the Korean War. In addition to the three current titles, it included four addressing broader management of the economy that have since lapsed. From its inception, the DPA has contained a sunset clause requiring periodic reauthorization to retain effect. Congress has reauthorized the act dozens of times and also amended many of its provisions. Some of these amendments have broadened the definition of national defense and thus the purposes for which the DPA may be used, expanded who is eligible for Title III assistance, and changed how Title III activities are funded. Congress has also altered reporting requirements and used Title VII to codify other industrial-based related authorities. The executive branch's use of the DPA has also changed. After extensive application during the Korean War, for instance, employment of Title III declined, reaching a nadir between the late 1960s and early 1980s before rising again starting in 1985. The use of Title I has been more consistent, although the contracts it supports have varied. In terms of its authorities, Title VII has historically been the least used title. The number, variety, and value of DPA activities increased dramatically beginning in 2020. This was initially driven by the use of its authorities, particularly Title I and Title III, by the Trump and Biden administrations to support COVID-19 response efforts, including through prioritizing pandemic-related contracts and expanding production of vaccines and medical supplies. However, since 2020, the Biden administration has also used the DPA for policy priorities, such as increasing production capacity to support Ukraine and strengthening clean energy supply chains. Turning now to the role of Congress, I wanted to highlight three potential issues this committee may face. Firstly, Congress pays for DPA activities. It does this mainly by making appropriations to the DPA fund, which pays for Title III projects. Since 2020, Congress has provided approximately $3.1 billion for the DPA fund, along with $10 billion made available for COVID-related DPA uses outside of the structure of this fund. 
Congress may consider what level of funding is appropriate for DPA activities and whether or not to change how it provides this funding. Secondly, Congress oversees the President's use of DPA authorities and funds. If Congress assesses that these are not being used in appropriate or effective ways, Congress has a variety of options, including developing and considering legislative provisions to, for instance, direct the use of the DPA for certain purposes or to modify notification or authorization requirements. Congress may also consider whether or not to amend provisions of the DPA itself to change how the President may use its authorities. Thirdly and finally, most of the DPA's provisions will expire on September 30th, 2025, unless they are reauthorized. Historically, reauthorization has supplied Congress with an occasion to consider other changes. So Congress may assess the overall efficacy of the statute as currently written, particularly its alignment with the requirements of great power competition and national strategy, and consider whether or not to make changes. This concludes my remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. DeCastro. And that would go to uh, Mr. Zakheim. Um, he's a, is the Washington Director at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute. Mr. Zakheim, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Beatty, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me today to testify on restoring national security as the focus of the Defense Production Act. As this committee considers the 54th reauthorization of the DPA, it is prudent to consider that the United States faces the most dangerous international security environment since 1980, at a time where the U.S. military has lost or is losing its military superiority over our adversaries, and during a moment where the size of the force is declining with every passing year. Perennial continuing resolutions and a flat or declining budgets have left the Pentagon unable to maintain its defense program, let alone grow the force to meet its national defense commitments. These factors, plus persistent combat and peacetime operations, have resulted in a military that has not been able to recapitalize its industrial base since the Reagan administration held office. During the same period, China has engaged in the largest military buildup since the Soviet Union in the 1960s. A few data points. Just this week, we learned China has increased its defense budget by 7.2% continuing a 20-year run of continuous growth. China has the largest navy in the world. And relevant most to the DPA, China's shipbuilding industry fields 232 times the shipbuilding capacity of the United States. 232 times the shipbuilding capacity of the United States. These reality makes this the most consequential reauthorization of the DPA since its enactment in 1950. As was mentioned, the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East have revealed that the United States may not be able to restore deterrence or, if necessary, prevail in a protracted conflict, absent a concerted effort to increase America's defense production. As Under Secretary of Defense Bill LaPlante recently just said, production itself is deterrence. While full inventory of the military's capacity shortfalls is beyond the scope of this testimony, three areas of urgent need are the following. One, munition and weapons, two, naval shipbuilding and maintenance, and three, supply chains and strategic materials shortfalls. My written testimony outlines the scope of the challenge in each of these categories and in ways the DPA can help. The objective in all these cases should be investment in extra capacity, stockpiling inventory, funding emerging technologies, and last, of course, expanding domestic production. In recent years, the DPA has drifted from its original focus on national defense to addressing non-defense national emergencies. While the use of the DPA for a national emergency like COVID-19 proved essential, it should be the exception and not the rule. The DPA, as originally enacted, defined national defense as the operations and activities of the armed forces that are, quote, substantially concerned with the national defense, end quote. It is essential that we return to the definition of the national defense definition as originally enacted with an annual appropriation supporting DPA projects via grants and loan guarantees. We must remember that capital invested in the DPA offers the taxpayer a trifecta. It helps the economy, it helps the American worker, and it strengthens our military. As this committee embarks on reauthorizing the DPA, 
It should consider upgrading the authority to address four essential elements of defense production value chain. Number one, capital or loan guarantees to drive increased production capacity. Two, incentives to build and sustain the defense industrial base workforce. Three, fast track permitting, as was mentioned, for DPA supported projects. And number four, supporting and sustaining single points of failure in the defense industrial base supply chain. Without a concerted focus across these four lines of effort, use of the DPA authority will produce suboptimal or uneven outcomes, risking failure. The United States should take advantage of this moment and recapitalize our military and expand America's industrial capacity. This would help build a military that can restore deterrence, uphold the peace, and avoid the wartime mobilization that the DPA was originally designed to address. It is time to put the D back in the DPA and to rededicate its funding and unique authorities to national defense priorities that catalyze defense production for the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Zakheim. Uh, Dr. Tucker is up next. Uh, Dr. Tucker is Director for Industrial Policy and Trade at the Roosevelt Institute. He's recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you, uh, Chairman, Ranking Member, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the DPA. Uh, as a political scientist who studied the history and evolution of the DPA, I wish to make three major points. First, the DPA promotes the health of the economy as a whole, both military and civilian. Uh, neither the DPA nor its predecessor laws from the Franklin Roosevelt administration uh, are narrowly focused on military issues or military procurement. From the beginning, the health of the civilian economy, and in particular, energy production, has been a central animating concern. After all, we do not have two economies, industries produced for both military and civilian sectors. The dual mandate is well reflected through the referral of jurisdiction of the law to this committee, which can take a broader view of the economy than your armed services counterparts. Uh, moreover, Executive Order 13603, uh, codifying the responsibilities for the DPA, give uh, major responsibilities to, uh, to a wide range of agencies beyond uh, just the Defense Department. Uh, looking at the DPA text itself, you can see why this dual mandate exists. It speaks to the importance of the health of the domestic industrial base as a whole, not simply the defense industrial base. Uh, it points out that the, that domestic industrial base needs support to have continuing improvements in its efficiency and responsiveness. Um, Moreover, the DPA goes further and states that independently of any particular military need, to the maximum extent possible, domestic energy supply should be augmented through reliance on renewable energy resources. Uh, and the text also points, points to the importance of the competitiveness of the industrial economy of the US as a whole. Second point, the DPA is a diverse toolkit with diverse applications, some at low to no cost to the taxpayer. Uh, first, Title I's priorities and allocations are used hundreds of thousands of times a year. These help resolve supply chain problems by making sure that materials go to the most urgent and important uses. FDR used the DPA's predecessor powers to ensure that steel and other materials were directed towards their highest value uses in both the civilian and military economy. President Trump used DPA authorities to get vaccine manufacturers the inputs they need and to go after price gouging in the PPE industry. And responding to demands from members of this committee and others, President Biden's use of the DPA prioritized baby formula manufacturers' orders of key ingredients, helping to ensure that parents across the country could feed their infants. Second, Title III, as has already been discussed, provides useful incentives to the, promote the industrial base of the country and energy production. Uh, FDR, President Trump, and President Biden have used these for a variety of uses, including critical minerals, uh, producing more aluminum, uh, and also uh, responding to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, third, Title VII gives the government the power to obtain information and encourage cooperation among private sector entities. Presidents Trump and Biden have used this to promote cooperation uh, among vaccine manuf manufacturers and distributors. Uh, both have also used the possibility of, of uh, soliciting mandatory information under Title VII to get more voluntary agreements with private industry. Third point, uh, the DPA can boost American competitiveness and preparedness in a volatile world. Uh, there are a number of serious threats that the DPA can help address. First, China and to lesser extent other trading partners are aggressively pursuing industrial policies to capture market share at the expense of US companies. 
in recent decades, we have seen this in steel, solar, and now electric vehicles. To put this in comparison, OPEC controls 40% of global petroleum production, a fact which has focused the minds of policymakers on this committee and elsewhere for half a century, century at least. Today, a single country, China, controls upwards of 90% of some of the supply chains that are critical to future energy resilience uh, and independence. Moreover, European allies are advancing beyond the US in critical sectors like wind and green steel. Second and relatedly, US economic, military, and intelligence agencies deem climate change one of the top risks to economic and national security. Uh, until recent years, it was rare for the United States to experience an extreme weather event that caused more than a billion dollars in damage. Today, these are happening on average once a month. Uh, in 2021, nearly 1,000 people died from these events. These events have lasting impacts on economic growth and financial security. Uh, Americans are affected this in still other ways, such as where DOD is incurring billions of dollars a year in damages to base camps from extreme events. Each of these dynamics will interact with the previously noted industrial policy trends to create both challenges and opportunities for the US industrial base and its efficiency, responsiveness, competitiveness, and access to energy. In the face of all of these challenges, the DPA can serve as a patch and complement to other laws enacted by Congress. Thank you for, for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Um, we'll now turn to member questions. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes uh, for, to begin the questioning. Um, Mr. DeCastro, um, the Defense Production Act has been reauthorized many, many times, as you mentioned. Uh, as we think about the next reauthorization, what lessons can this committee draw from previous experiences, and what are the best practices that emerge from your review of its history? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think to the extent that Congress can take a forward-thinking approach and incorporate its priorities as these relate to national strategy generally and industrial policy more specifically, that has, um, I believe, tended to be looked back upon by Congresses uh, as an element of successful reauthorization of the DPA. As an example, one could look to how the DPA was reauthorized in the aftermath of the Korean War and see that um, the Congress at that period was looking forward to potential future crises and trying to alter the legislation such that the authorities that were necessary when the US was actively engaged in hostilities in Korea were uh, eliminated or were allowed to lapse, or while those that were suitable to a more peacetime environment uh, were retained and potentially expanded. You know, each of you in your testimony talk about uh, the importance of this uh, act, and I, I certainly agree with that. I think it's very important that we're able to protect our country and find ways to uh, move forward with um, supply chain problems and be able to prioritize our defense needs over some of the others from time to time. Um, and, and the production, one of you made the comment with regards to a deterrent, having stockpiles, I think Mr. Zakai made the comment with regards to having a stockpiles of this stuff, actually, even if we never have to use it as a deterrent, other people, other countries around the world to be less aggressive. So I think it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a need for all this. Um, kind of concerned about the, uh, you know, the expansion of this. Uh, what what uh, Mr. Nadonner and Mr. Zakheim, you've both commented quite extensively, extensively on concerns about it. Um, and when we see some of the things that we've used it for, um, like to solve the baby formula problem, for instance, um, <laughs> trust me, I'm not against children. I realize that was a, that was a national problem at that time. But I don't know, is, is implementing as in, uh, the, the National Production uh, Defense Act, is that a way to solve that? Or can the president by executive order do that? Uh, would each one of you like to comment on, on some of the things that we were using it for now? And are there other alternatives, such as executive order, other ways to address this rather than use the, Defe the, the Defense Production Act? Either one or both. Uh, Chairman, um, I could not agree with you more. I think the uh, one way is to go to Congress. Uh, and to seek an appropriation. And Congress will, on something like baby formula, will act very quickly, at least that's my experience. Um, I think if the Defense Production Act covers everything uh, from national defense to the weather, national defense in itself is, is a, a very substantial undertaking. So I believe it has to be something that, uh, if it's outside national defense, it has to be something on which basic societal functioning depends like the electricity may go out or the water may go out. And we may face scenarios like that in the future, or there's a terrible disease. Do we need a definition in law then to, 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 to codify this in a way that it kind of narrows a little bit? Or, or is there something else that's in here that already does? No, I think uh, there could be some narrowing in the law. 
uh, you know, maybe a good place to start. The Obama era uh, national preparedness uh, executive order even expands upon the law. I, I would trim that down uh, to these two core areas, basic societal functioning and military systems. Uh, Mr. Sakai. Mr. Chairman, I would only add that we ought to tailor the use of the DPA and the funding to the national defense strategy. It's quite clear what the priority is in the national defense strategy. China is labeled as a pacing threat. It is the first. Uh, there are distant second, thirds, and fourths. And that should be reflected in the allocation use of this very unique authority. And I think that would help uh, the execution of the law. And certainly, if you're in a national emergency, there's flexibility. It's why it's so unique. But day to day, it should be guided by our national defense strategy. And of course, China, whether you're looking at the Biden national defense strategy or the Trump defense strategy, starts with the People's Republic of China. OK, Mr. Dodonna, uh, very quickly here. My time is running out. Uh, with regards to oversight over this, uh, inspector generals are in a number of different agencies uh, that wind up utilizing the uh, DPA. Uh, do you see a need for uh, an, AG, an IG over just this program, or is there, are they adequate where they're at? Should we have are the agencies compile themselves into one so that there's some more, actually some oversight over everything? How do you how do you see because now we're at billions of dollars rather than a few millions of dollars that are invested in this program? What do you how do you see that? I think I would require more transparency from the office on a regular basis. Um, however, a IG that is going to be dedicated to this uh, program, I think it's going to have a chilling effect. Um, mm -hmm. One of the problems that we've had with DPA is uh, the action is too slow, and that's partially because of risk aversion. Okay. And I think the, you know, if there's a problem, IGs can be appointed, there's GAO, and there's certainly congressional hearings. Okay, my time's up. I appreciate that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, with that, we go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nicastro, uh, nearly all Defense Production Act authorities will terminate on September 30th, 2025, with few exceptions such as the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States and Antitrust Protections for certain voluntary industry agreements. As the primary committee of jurisdiction in the House, we're responsible for the reauthorization. Could you give us examples of what would happen if, if, if this authorization were to lapse? Thank you, Congressman. The biggest uh, impact of a lapse of this authorization would be the loss of tools for the executive branch. And these tools have been used uh, off and on for over seven decades. Um, with Title I, you're talking, you would be talking about a change to the way that DOD does its contracting because the priorities and allocation system is very deeply ingrained. Uh, DOD reports placing an average of 300,000 to 350,000 of what they call rated orders through that system. With respect to Title III, DOD reports at least 56 active projects that are ongoing. So presumably, if that authority were to lapse, um, those projects could not be executed. And again, that is a, a fairly substantial tool um, that the executive would lose access to. Thank you. Traditionally, uh, and this is to, to all witnesses, traditionally the Defense Production Act has been a bipartisan law with broad support from both parties. Together, members of Congress have supported the Defense Production Act uh, used through wars and pandemics, among other crises. Um, why is it important to keep the law and, and the reauthorization uh, in a bipartisan, as a bipartisan endeavor, and why should members reject partisan rhetoric and actions when it comes to national defense? I'm happy to begin. Um, sir, if you look at every president of any stripe political party, this is a tool they rely on, um, and of course, uh, whether it's uh, engage, if the United States is engaged in armed conflict, or as I've outlined, trying to prevent one through deterrence or national emergency like COVID-19, uh, you don't wear your, 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 your party suit for that one. You're American, and this is an essential tool, which is why uh, we have the opportunity to testify, testify before you as you consider the 54th authorization. I don't have to tell members of this committee how uh, unusual perhaps it is to have one law see that many uh, authorizations and its reflection of its importance. What I think we're talking about here across the dais, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues, is the prioritization. Because the challenges before us are great, and on the national defense front, they run deep, and this is an essential tool with limited resources, and they should be allocated to our national defense priorities. Thank you. I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, 
this is also to all witnesses, in defense, in defense one, article two experts on the Defense Production Act and government contracting note that a national defense, at national defense, that the Defense Production Act is governed by a mishmash of old and overlapping executive orders spanning numerous administrations. Should the Biden administration consider how to refresh and simplify these decades of orders, perhaps issuing a new executive order that clearly outlines and aligns the Defense Production Act and other authorities, uh, policies and responsibilities uh, to better position the government to address future national emergencies? And if so, what do you suggest? If I may, sir, um, I, I have, I've been the administrator of the Defense Production Act. I did not find uh, the collection of executive orders that date back sometimes uh, a few decades, but most of them are fairly recent. Um, I didn't find it an impediment. I do think there are structural changes in the office that uh, administers DPA that could be useful and that could be written into law. I think one is uh, currently the law requires that office to use an executive agent from the Air Force. That's performed out of Dayton, Ohio. Um, that made sense in the days when the, when the total office for industrial base, all the functions, way beyond DPA, had around 10 people. Today there are several hundred people. So I think the distance um, from decision makers is a problem. It's creating a principal agent issue. So I would end the uh, executive agent. And then I think there's a need for a real, uh, not just bodies, but just really subject matter experts. We're talking about areas like energetics, welding, machining, advanced manufacturing. So I think there's roughly 10 sort of masters and PhD level experts that are required. And I, I believe that the law should allow that office to pay for that as a percentage of the grant. Thank you, I yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. That would go to the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, Thank chairman you. of the Financial Institutions Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Zakheim, I was uh, very impressed with your testimony that the DPA, uh, impressed and alarmed with your testimony that the DPA has drifted from its original focus on national defense to addressing non-defense national emergencies. and. Uh, none is more alarming, no example is more alarming than your testimony that none, zero, of the DPA funding appropriated in the Inflation Reduction Act has gone to core national defense needs. Mr. Zakheim, what is the specific and pressing danger of allowing the DPA to lose its focus on national defense? Uh, thank you for the question. It's what I outlined in the testimony if you look at our core national defense needs, they are suffering from insufficient funds to get after the recapitalization and increase of capacity. And that runs, as I outlined, in, in three core areas. If you look at the funding outlook um, on the annual basis and defense appropriations that the Department of Defense relies upon, it is declining year over year in terms of what they have planned in the program for the DPA. In other words, these increasing needs, whether it be munitions or shipbuilding, ship maintenance, there's gonna be, as based on the Biden administration's funding program, fewer and fewer dollars available to, to, to address those critical national defense needs. As a result, we need to prioritize. Um, I mean, if you just look in the, in, in the coming years, uh, we have $949 million in FY24. Uh, it's gonna go down by nearly half uh, in the next two fiscal years. You know, one of the things that I've said a lot, not only in this uh, National Security Security Committee, but also as a member of the a China Select Committee, is that we should not try to counter China by becoming more like China. We should not think that we can counter China or deter China or, or, or defend ourselves against Chinese aggression by imitating Chinese industrial policy. And so the DPA does serve a narrow and, and unique purpose, but non-defense related matters should not be um, the target of the DPA, and I think you make a good point for prioritization. Um, uh, Dr. Nadiner, um, uh, accelerating FMS to Taiwan is critical to maintaining deterrence across the Taiwan Strait, but there is currently, as you well know, a $19 billion backlog of weapons that the U.S. has sold but not delivered to Taiwan. How can the DPA be used to accelerate those deliveries to establish the deterrence necessary? Uh, the Title I authorities can be used to uh, give prioritization to those orders, but the uh, creaky defense industrial base is gonna need a lot of injections 
of DPA Title III grants or um, loan guarantees. It just simply uh, it just simply cannot produce very much. If you notice, sir, around the world, uh, our adversaries, China, Iran, North Korea, they do not have problems producing large numbers of weapons. We, on the other hand, the collection of countries, the U.S., Europe, our allies in Asia, do have trouble. And that tells you a lot about the correlation of forces. I think that's why we need to focus the DPA on national security only, because uh, we do have a prioritization uh, uh, need, and that's why DPA should be squarely focused on uh, cross-strait deterrence and, and FMS deliveries to Taiwan and our own industrial base, uh, defense industrial base. Um, let, me, let me ask you about critical minerals, because I'm very concerned about our over-reliance on China for critical minerals and how the DPA could, could help decrease our, that dependence. Um, the PRC has already weaponized their holdings of these minerals uh, and their dominance of not only the, the supply and production of critical minerals, but also the processing. And they've temporarily cut off exports of gallium, germanium, and graphite in 2023, weaponizing the supply chain. Last year, the total value of minerals in the U.S. national defense stockpile was only $1.3 billion, which was 8.8 percent of DOD's 2023 stockpile requirements, a shortfall of $13.5 billion. What can Congress do through the, through the Defense Production Act, Dr. Nadiner, to close this rather significant gap in our stockpile? Uh, critical minerals and rare earths uh, are needed in every weapon system and, indeed, all the electronics that we use every day. Um, the fundamental reason how China has uh, grabbed the processing market for minerals, they don't even have that many, they don't have that much minerals uh, in rare earths. Uh, they import a lot of them, but they own the processing, is largely through subsidies. Um, if we want to have processing in the U.S., uh, we're going to have to alleviate the CapEx cost. And that's DPA Title III, particularly the loan guarantees, could make a big difference to enable Americans to get back in the processing uh, business. My time has expired. Thanks for the recommendation. But also, I think we need to look at permitting reform. We can mine critical minerals in the United States if the administration would stop its war on mining in America. And we can become uh, a national security independent of, of, of China on this issue. Without a yield. Chairman yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina is next. Mr. Nichols, recognized for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for our witnesses for being here today. Uh, the Defense Production Act is an essential tool for our national defense. Not only can we use it to ensure military readiness in times of crisis, but we can also protect the health and safety of everyone in the U.S., including members of our armed forces. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the U.S. government deployed the Defense Production Act to help America respond to the crisis speeding up the production and access to critical materials like masks, vaccines, and ventilators. DOD, for example, awarded O&M Halyard a $29 million contract under the DPA to expand its production of N95 masks, including at a facility in Lexington, North Carolina. Additionally, DOD awarded North Carolina company Burlington Industries a $6.8 million contract to sustain and strengthen the domestic clothing and textile industrial base. This company has provided uniform fabric to the U.S. military for over 70 years. This vital funding came at a time when North Carolinians were struggling with the virus and to make ends meet. Unemployment and economic distress were rising as the country coalesced to tackle this significant public health challenge. Without DPA funding, our health troops, and national defense all would have suffered. Additionally, if we're reliant on countries like China for crucial medical devices, we're jeopardizing our national security. Investments in public health are investments in our national defense. Uh, first question for you, Dr. Tucker. Uh, does dependency on foreign production for critical health supplies like ventilators create vulnerabilities for our national defense? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the DPA defines the national defense broadly to include about a dozen different considerations, all of which speak to the ability of domestic industry and the domestic indus industrial base to supply not only military but also civilian needs. And it's been that way since the predecessor legislation of the second and, uh, First and Second War Powers Act during the Roosevelt years. So absolutely, that resilience uh, against sort of over-dependence on foreign supply has always been a key mandate. Thanks. Dr. Tucker, uh, as Congress has expanded the definition of national defense 
In what ways do novel uses of the DPA, like in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, improve our national security? Public health is a key contributor to our ability to be resilient uh, as a country, and that affects both uh, both uh, our citizens that are in the military as well as as well as elsewhere. Certainly, DPA uh, within hours uh, of, of of sort of COVID hitting the United States, members of this committee and others made clear that we needed to use this exceptional authority to be able to address an exceptional challenge. Thanks. You, you presented a persuasive argument in your opening statement for why renewables and clean energy are appropriate for DPA activity for our national defense. I, I'm sure you'd agree that there are boundaries with that. Uh, we can't solve the climate crisis entirely with the DPA. Can you pr please provide some examples of where DPA use would be appropriate? Uh, for example, how do we ensure that Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in my district in North Carolina can continue to function without a reliable source of power? Absolutely. There, there's a reason that energy production has always been, uh, and, and very explicitly in the last several decades, uh, a key part of the DPA. It's because of the recognition that the rest of the economy runs on energy. Uh, so there has been an emphasis on both renewable and non-renewable sources of energy uh, to be able to exactly keep Air Force bases, Army bases running, but as well as the rest of the civilian economy because the ability of the domestic industrial base to meet any of the needs that Congress has outlined in terms of its de definition of national security and national defense is crucial on the supply of energy. Th thanks so much, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. That would go to the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Muser is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Thank you all for being here. It's an interesting uh, situation. I appreciate all of your, your, your insights thus far and your opening statements. So uh, I particularly like the uh, statement, we need to put the D back in DPA. Uh, and it sounds like that needs to be done, and that needs to be taken very, very seriously. So, you know, the White House has many uh, regulatory loopholes uh, to subsidize and has been doing the green energy projects instead of, you know, fossil fuels and such and nuclear and, and all. Um, and one, one could make an argument, as some of you are, that that's at the expense of our national security. Um, when we don't have a all of the above and all of the below as well uh, approach, we purchase from Russia, China, Venezuela, Iran, um, and allow them to fulfill the needs of all kinds of other countries as well. So um, that's just that's just that's just backwards thinking. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act appropriated five hundred million dollars for the DPA activities through September just through this September, as you all know. Now, 250 million of it uh, was used for, not for mining, but for purchasing of critical uh, minerals from the countries I, I just named, from some of the, from Venezuela and elsewhere. And another $250 million out of, I believe, a billion dollar budget was used for electric heat pumps. So, you know, electric. What, what, what creates electricity? Coal, in, in many cases. So, you know, this isn't, it's not working. Usually when you, when ideology is put in front of re realistic planning and results, foolish things happen. So, you know, the level of discretion does seem based upon the, uh, as, is too broad for the ideologies of, 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 of this administration. I mean, they're not following what the intent of the DPA is. And, and, and I think this discussion is, uh, makes that pretty clear. So Mr. Zakheim, um, you know, is, is in your view, is the White House exploiting the broad authority in Section 303 uh, and picking winners and losers and which, which company to buy uh, heating electric heating pumps from and, and, and such? Um, and is it outside of the in intended use of the funds within the DPA? No, th thank you for the question, and I think it was a missed opportunity. Uh, certainly, um, the allocation of uh, the $250 million in the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and as we've been discussing, going forward, what does the Department of Defense and what does this Congress intend to do? As I noted, that if you look at the Biden administration budget, 
the funds that they're planning to put against EPA are declining significantly, uh, roughly half of what was authorized and appropriated uh, we, uh, in the previous fiscal year. At the same time, this Congress, sir, has passed a law in last year's National Defense Authorization Act requiring that any, especially uh, uh, minerals and materials that, come from, that are sourced from China need to be sourced elsewhere, primarily by the United States, by 2028. And so what I would think this committee would want to do as it reauthorizes DPA is say, well, how are we going to ensure that that mandate passed by this Congress for 2028, uh, how is the DPA going to support that? And that, I think, uh, leads to the prioritization, sir, that, that you seem to be emphasizing, which I agree with. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Nadnayer, uh, can you discuss the role of the U.S.'s uh, the domestic permitting process? Uh, is, it, is it playing a counter effect to as we spend this money on mining, which is really purchasing uh, these minerals from elsewhere, uh, how that plays into this? And should that be considered part of the DPA mandate or uh, w within the DPA so as we can um, utilize our, our own natural resources? Yes, uh, mining and uh, mineral processing uh, has an inextricable link to the DPA, particularly when we are so dependent. The fact is that to do almost anything significant in terms of infrastructure in this country, um, we have a permitting process uh, that is double the time of Canada and Norway and Australia. These are countries that have environmental laws that are at least as good as ours, if not superior. Double the time. So if it's seven years to get the permitting and the litigation done in Canada, it's 14 years here. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. With that, we go to the gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Foster is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to our witnesses. Um, I'm going to start out by saying I'm a big fan of how the, the flexibility of these authorities have been used. Uh, in the last uh, Congress, I was on the COVID Select Committee, and I collaborated with Representative Mark Green in initiating and, um, and observing the GAO oversight of Operation Warp Speed. And I have to say I was impressed that you know this was an emergency um the standard was not zero waste the you know the standard was maximum haste and that was a good decision and and so i went away you know there were many lessons learned uh, from that and the gao is a really valuable tool in this but i think that's an example where something completely unanticipated turned out to be crucial and so i'm a fan of keeping these flexible um however i'm not other well, a bunch of issues mr nicastro just what, what fraction of all of our military spending uh, goes through the DPA? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, it, the answer will depend on the time frame that we look at, but if we look at um, DPA spending since FY 2020, say, inclusive, um, that's about $13.1 billion. Um, so compare that against the total defense budgets for the past uh, four fiscal years, or three fiscal years, um, and it's a, it's a fairly small fraction. What, it's like to say. percent level? or even less. What, what's the total total defense? I, I, so $13.1 billion, sir. Um, yeah. And if you had an annual defense budget, you know, around uh, $800 billion, so it's a... It's annual, okay. All right, so this is a, you know, probably it sounds like a sub-percent level. Yes, sir. Um, and so that is, yeah, so the, it's not, um, yeah, so, uh, Mr. Zach, I'm, it, you, you mentioned the, our inability to build ships at the same scale. So the money that we spend on the DP, through the DPA is not going to rebuild the shipbuilding industry. That has to ha be handled at a much higher level. And uh, would you agree that that's, you know, th these, are, these are very targeted small things, not big, big ticket items? Yes, and, and as, as, as you know, there's, there's shipbuilding accounts authorization appropriation but this is such a unique authority that can have outsized impact. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize uh, today, that if we allocate this uh, against some of these capital projects, and I would also advocate increased appropriations for the DPA, you could have that outside impact. As Dr. Nadoner has referenced these loan guarantees, for example, a loan program, if it's revitalized, could have a significant impact on, on, on ship maintenance facilities and ship building uh, of the capital nature where the current industry is unable to accomplish. Sir, okay. if I may add, uh, yeah. it is conceivable that a future Congress, 
and a president faced with a national emergency coming from abroad may say, we need to produce a lot more. And in that case, I could easily see, given the holes in the defense industrial base, and how slow production's going, you could see $50 billion a year. It would make a huge difference in the industrial base and allow production. Okay, and how should we deal with the problems with political allocation of capital, you know, fighting the last war, um, you know, senators uh, preserving shipyards that happen to be in their states for things that really have limited military value? You know, I, I was, you mentioned China's EV subsidies. You know, there are vast junkyards of junk EV vehicles in China because factories have been built to capture the subsidies rather than to produce cars that will actually be used. And, you know, so that, um, you know, do you have any thoughts on how we try to avoid that? Um, you know, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, because the scale of China's subsidies are so vast, I think, you know, we, we just heard from the CRS about the, the small, relatively small amounts that are going to this in the United States. I think what you're hearing actually from all of the testifiers today is that there would be value in, in significantly more resources being dedicated than we are today. Uh, and I think we're still quite a far ways away from uh, from the DPA being a, a wasteful, a source of a lot of waste in U.S. government spending. I just want to add qu quickly here, I think the problem we face from an industrial base standpoint, from a defense industrial base program, is not that we've held on to things we don't need, is that because we drew down, particularly in the early 90s, we lost the things that we need, businesses became more efficient, and those capabilities went overseas primarily to China. And it's that problem that we're trying to recover from right now. Yeah, but if you look into the future, um, you know, drone swarms are gonna be much more cost effective than uh, capital ships. And in fact, a big fraction of China's um, uh, ships will not survive the first, um, you know, the first few hours of a, of a heavy shooting war. There's no question you need a mixer of new tech, but I think as we see from Ukraine and what the contingency operations look like in a Taiwan Strait scenario as referenced earlier, you're gonna need ships, particularly uh, undersea warfare of the kind that we have, we need more of. All right, my time's up and yield back. Jumping yields back, that we go to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Kim, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lickmeyer. Um, I wanna thank our witnesses for being with us today. The conflicts around the world increase the demand of U.S. weapons from our allies, and that demand has also overstretched our weapon-making capabilities that was revered and revealed the um, fragility of our domestic industrial base. For example, according to one report, there is just one factory in the United States that can manufacture the black powder for one of the shells most widely used by the Ukrainian military. And our shipping, shipbuilding cap, uh, capability has also diminished in the last few decades. According to U.S. Naval Institute report, we have seen shipyards that build warships for the Navy, while the CCP operates more than 20 shipyards to support their neighbor shipbuilding. Mr. Zakheim uh, or Mr. Ned, Nay Daner, I'm sorry, um, you can both answer this question. Uh, do you believe that DPA can be utilized as a tool to encourage more competition? And if so, are there any changes that could be uh, made to do so? I'll start and then uh, uh, turn it over to Dr. Nadoner. Uh, and thank you for the question. I think with the allocation of the DPA, uh, those making the awards, as Dr. Nadoner oversaw in his time in the Pentagon, need to make sure that the projects not only ensure that the capital is going there and it's going to increase capacity, but we're also looking to use the DPA against key areas like permitting, as was referenced before, uh, and workforce uh, programs to help make sure that if the capital goes in, the project can actually be executed based on these other things. And, and Dr. Donner uh, has referenced mm -hmm. how we are way behind in terms of the permitting. But I do think that uh, the DPA, because of its unique authorities, we will, we will see uh, the funding go up in the future and scale to address some of the strategic problems that you've uh, just identified. Thank you. Uh, this committee has a weighty responsibility to create the framework that other committees will then have the option and then the full Congress uh, of implementing. I would note that with uh, whether it is the more traditional heavy big systems or the new systems like artificially intelligent drones and swarms, the percentage of Chinese 
parts and components in these systems. It's unforgivable. And if there's a trade cessation, I'm not even talking about conflict, just let's say there's a trade interruption, all these factory lines that produce these drones are going to stop mm. because they have anywhere sometimes from 10 to 40 percent essential Chinese components in our systems. Thank you. You know, in Executive Order 14110, the Biden administration compels private industry to provide information on its development of artificial intelligence products. That order makes a seemingly novel use of DPA's Title 12, um, Title 7, a compulsory information gathering authority applied uh, to an industry that has not otherwise been subject to DPA actions under either Title 1 or Title 3. Has the DPA been used this way before? And if so, how often has it been used? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> um, I can give it a shot, uh, Congresswoman. Um, so Title VII has been used historically to inform um, what are often referred to as industrial base assessments, which have been conducted uh, under the aegis of the Department of Commerce. Um, you are correct that, uh, to my knowledge at least, artificial intelligence has not been the subject uh, of the application of those authorities. Um, so you know, this does raise a question as to um, which areas Congress believes to be the most appropriate for the application of DPA authorities? There is there's an up, there's a monetization issue in terms of how the DPA will operate in Title VII. So mm -hmm. Title VII operates, it's basically the government is issuing a survey for how something goes. That's a very old way of doing things. Today, in the commercial sector, people sit in front of a laptop, mm -hmm. they do a few keystrokes, and they can find out all the capabilities in the supply chains, whether it's artificial intelligence, software, or the hardware, they can do that all instantaneously. And Congress has provided for that uh, through the commercial preference rule. So I think that an updated DPA would be wise to uh, reinforce with the executive branch its disregard of the commercial preference rule, which Congress has thought about and has made part of the law. Thank you. One last question, uh, Mr. Zuckheim. Can you explain the importance of surge capacity regarding the United States defense industrial base? I mean, as we've seen from the war in Ukraine, and I know we're over time here, I'll be quick, we are not able to surge. Production lines have been uh, made to be just in time. And what we've seen, that may work for the Walmarts of the world, but for national defense, just in time means just out of time. We can't realize our national defense objectives. Thank you very much, my time. The only time expired, let go the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, who's recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. I think it's been very illuminating. Uh, I, um, I guess I, I'd start at the beginning by saying that no one here is saying we should get rid of the DPA. Is that correct? I mean, it, it seems to me that the flexibility that it provides is something that's good. Um, we're arguing here about what should be in it and what should not be in it, which I think is important. Um, during COVID, I introduced legislation to support the President's use of the Defense Production Act authorities to further strengthen the production, acquisition, distribution of critical medical supplies across America during the public health emergency because I thought it was part of national defense. In fact, it's very interesting. Why do we call the Spanish flu the Spanish flu? Does anybody know why? Why don't we pick on somebody here Mr. Zakheim, why do we call the Spanish flu the Spanish flu? I believe it happened during the war in Spain, and then, and then also in World War I. Okay, not exactly. Why don't we try somebody else? Go ahead, sir. Um, sir, I, be I believe it was uh, an effort to avoid a panic associated with American troops being overseas in World War I because Spain was not a combatant in that war. That's exactly right. In other words, the, the Spanish flu didn't originate in Madrid or in Spain. And in fact, because of the war, we were trying to not let people know that a lot of our soldiers were getting sick also. And we were able to control the media back then a little bit more than we can today. And that's why ultimately they called it the Spanish flu. But noting that because of our defense, because of our national defense, because our troops were in, in, uh, in harm's way, that's why we didn't want people to know that they were sick. So that is national defense. So I think it was very, well used during the pandemic 
once again, uh, the pandemic was, I, I think, something of, of national defense criteria. Would anyone disagree with that? I would not disagree with that. Uh, I think that there, there is not a clear boundary uh, when it comes to a lot of these things between military and civilian production. Our, the Congress has rightly recognized over 52 times that these things are deeply interconnected, which is why you've had bipartisan and often unanimous uh, approvals for exactly those types of uses. And, and, and I agree with that. And I think it gives the executive some flexibility too, frankly, not only us, but the executive some, frank, uh, some flexibility that's, that's necessary. So I think that that's very important. Now, one of the things that did concern me, I represent the city of San Diego, and I represent the shipbuilding base there. And one of the things that they do very hard is try to get work, both private work and government work, to keep afloat. But that has been a real problem. Um, Mr. Zakheim, I think you were the one that gave us that startling statistic, 232 times the capacity that we have. It doesn't seem like the DPA maybe necessarily is the right place to, to create that capacity. But I, I am very concerned about that. How can the DPA work in conjunction with other authorities to help, because I do think that this is a problem, especially being on the Pacific and understanding the issues of the Pacific Ocean out there and how we do need shipbuilding. No matter what people think of the modern age, the reality is you will need some ships. Well, I, I agreed, sir, and um, you know, there's a GAO in a 2023 report said there's a $1.8 billion backlog in ship maintenance in addition to the shipbuilding. And as we referenced earlier, the DPA would complement the shipbuilding accounts that the Armed Services Committee and the Defense Appropriations Committee uh, authorize and appropriate. And so it's, it's a key tool that should complement that effort. And I think the dynamic that the Department of Defense is facing is it doesn't have the funding available for the capital expenditures and then to go directly into the supply chain uh, it works, of course, through primes primarily. Uh, and as a result, the DPA is an essential tool. And as Dr. Nadana referenced, I think if we're gonna get after this problem, you would see increased appropriation and allocation for DPA to get at a scale uh, problem like shipbuilding. And, and I do think that it could be used strategically that way, and I do think that we should take a look at that. And again, I, I thank all of you for being here. I appreciate the commentary this morning. I thought it was excellent uh, from all of you. And, and I do think that this is a good authority that we have, and we just have to figure out how to use it a little bit better. And again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for bringing it forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, questions, and uh, gentleman yields back. With that, we go to the gentleman from uh, Iowa. Mr. Nunn is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate this entire panel for being here. We've talked a lot about the big picture aspect of the defense industrial base. I'd really like to hone in on some of those cutting edge technologies and the smaller elements that help our defense industrial base be so both fluid and successful. Uh, you know, for a while I worked with the Defense Innovation Unit out in California, really bringing in some of the technology piece as a liaison there before I took um, this exciting job. Uh, but now that I uh, look back in Iowa, I recognize immediately we've got a ton of small businesses that are helping in the defense sector. RMA Armaments, Wellman Dynamics, and then of course some of the bigger ones like Collin Aerospace all play a critical role, all have a component uh, in our hometowns. So the time is now for the U.S. to gain a competitive advantage, Mr. Chairman, and the defense technology manufacturing side of this. I really want to begin, um, Dr. Nadler, you've obviously worked at the Department of Defense, you've seen this. Do private sector defense tech startups have an easy follow-on path uh, to get into government procurement and acquisition? Sir, they do not. Uh, 15, 20 years ago in the Department of Defense, all of the flag officers were saying, why can't I have the technology that exists in the commercial sector? I look at my iPhone, why do I have this cumbersome equipment here? Well, to, and there weren't many startups. Now there are a ton of them. American entrepreneurship is very strong. A lot of people in the tech sector want to help defense. And they can do things sometimes 10 to 20 times cheaper. However, the path into the Department of Defense, because of the DFARS, is extremely hard. And the Defense Production Act could open up a lot of competition if used properly. Now, talk to us about some of the things that could help a startup company, whether it's something in artificial intelligence or whether it's a guy making a better armament or body protective vest, be able to get on with the, uh, our Department of Defense today. Well, one is Title I can be used uh, to give them a priority allocation for the order. Uh, then the uh, CapEx is always an issue. And defense, defense equipment has hardware, and it's CapEx intensive, and CapEx is a very unfavorable thing in the US right. economy compared to Germany, Korea, or Japan. So 
the DPA Title III grants could enable them to have the infrastructure that they need to produce that hardware. Thank you, Doctor. I think it's really important that we also look at what the need base is. Uh, Mr. Zakim, you've talked uh, with us just here today that we have moved from just in time to just out of time. Let's be um, judicious about this. Does the DIB currently have the ability to meet a surge capacity if we needed it right now? I can't think of an example where we have a surge capacity across the defense requirements. And we have ongoing conflicts in Europe, in the Middle East. It's depleted what backfill we already have. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. That's why the supplemental is so essential. If China were to invade Taiwan today, Mr. Chairman, one of the questions I have for you, Mr. Zakim, is would the U.S. be properly positioned to react in a sufficient manner for us to be successful in that conflict? Well, we certainly have uh, our defense leadership dealing with this and getting ready for it every day. But the way I would think about it, particularly as it relates to the Defense Production Act, is what happens if it's a protracted conflict? That's the question this committee needs to internalize. The first week, the first two weeks, the first three, three weeks, it should be all right. But if it goes on longer, and as we look at conflicts that they've played out in recent years, they do, that's where we will feel the strain, and that's where we regret not properly, properly capitalizing this particular authority. So like any good military officer, we've identified the threat. I want to talk about solutions now. Talk to us a little bit about what the DPA might do to mitigate some of the shortfalls within the DIB. Well, I've outlined a, a bunch of my testimony. Uh, Dr. Donner uh, emphasized permitting, uh, which, which I have in my testimony as well. But one that you made me think of was a conversation I recently had with the CEO of a new startup, venture-backed entity, the kind that you would have engaged with at DIU, put in for DPA, author DPA support. 18 months later, he is still waiting. And this would be a game-changing manufacturing technology that would actually remove a requirement for tooling and manufacturing because of 3D printing capability. That sort of timeline doesn't reflect the urgency of the problem. I want to thank the panel. I think the key takeaway here is that we have so much innate capability here in the United States, ready to be leveraged, the innovation alone to be able to bring to the battlefield to make a time-changing success, not only in loss of life, but in the scale of capacity to be first shooter successful, and yet we're making our own restrictions on this. 18 months is a kind example. I've got guys who are waiting years to be able to unramp this. DPA is a great opportunity for us to be able to leverage this. Thank you to the panel. I yield the remainder of my time. Gentleman yells back. With that, go to the ranking member of the full committee, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Waters, is recognized for Thank five you minutes. very much, Mr. Chairman. This is to Dr. Tucker. In a bipartisan way, this committee has repeatedly discussed the issue of the supply of essential rare earth elements and critical materials. Most of these are in the control of China's government and Chinese government controlled companies. That's the key reason why so many members on both sides of the aisle applauded President Biden's executive order and executive order from the previous administration also to expand the DPA to address defense industrial base capacity shortfalls in items such as batteries, castings, and forgings, critical minerals extraction, and rare earth processing. Can you speak uh, to the effects of this expansion in light of China's dominance in this space and what it means for our national defense? Absolutely. Uh, China, if depending on the material in question, controls upwards of 90 percent, uh, even in some cases a near total monopoly of some of these critical minerals and critical uh, rare earth materials. So uh, the United States is very far behind at this point uh, ch where China is. DPA is a crucial tool in, in the U.S. government's toolbox uh, to try to uh, make patches where the where private where the private markets, where the private financial sector uh, is not going. Uh, and so President Biden has used DPA for critical minerals. The Trump administration did as well in terms of inputs for batteries. So this has been a bipartisan priority to try to identify those industries of the future uh, that are going to be really important to our energy resilience going forward. Well, that's, I think that's a good point, uh, to identify what the use is going to be for the future, but I'm interested in if we're not able to have the minerals that needs to be extracted, what do we do? 
It's, it's a great question. Uh, one of the advantages to using the DPA, several of the panelists here have mentioned permitting uh, and, and uh, other hurdles such as that. The DPA has a lot of authorities to allow executive branch to, uh, to get over some of those permitting hurdles when those become really tight constraints. So that could be used in a variety of ways to have sustainable, environmentally sustainable, uh, worker-friendly mining uh, in the United States. I don't know what the relationship is in terms of these minerals uh, between China and the United States, but does China have the ability or even the thought that they would preclude us uh, from having access, not even purchase, uh, in order to hurt us? We've certainly seen China do that with a variety of its trading partners, that whenever other countries start to suggest that China behave more responsibly, they weaponize the use of their own supply chains to deny inputs uh, to other countries, which is why it's a key, not, not only national security, but energy security and economic security imperative for the United States to diversify away from that single source. Uh, this is an unfair question, but how do we retaliate? <laughs> by using the DPA effectively and efficiently, uh, and by giving it more money so that it can do more of its good work. Uh, so you see this as a nil, real national security concern. Absolutely, and so has members of this committee and Congress going back to at least the 1970s, if not the 1940s. Uh, so absolutely, it's a key, key national security concern. Well, thank you for being here with this testimony today, and I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. With well, that, uh, we are out of uh, questioners today, so we would uh, like to thank our witnesses for being here today. You gentlemen did a great job, and we appreciate your expertise and your sharing your knowledge with us today, You've given us a lot of ideas on uh, things we need to do. Hopefully, you'll be able to, again, help us as we go through the process of trying to find ways to improve this. Um, the DPA is an important tool in a toolbox of the Defense Department and the President to be able to address needs uh, as, they, as they come up, as well as uh, be able to have the foresight to understand what the needs may be in the future. And so if you can help us with that, we'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, I have a letter here uh, from the AFP Foundation with regards to oversight. would like to uh, enter the record without ob uh, objection. And other, also without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for the response. Ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you can. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.